I'm going to go with a basic approach. The approach that I'm going to go with is pretty much what I've learned. Now, what I've learned is not set in stone. It's not long gospel. It's not any, anything like that. There's a really cool publication on the little cart right outside the door that if you didn't pick that up, it's called, um, it's a nice glossy guide. Guide to Backyard Maple Sugaring, right there. If you didn't get one of those and you're getting started, grab one of those. This is great. There's about three publications out there. This one comes from Missouri. There is one that, uh, a really good one from Penn State and another one from New Hampshire. But this one's really good because it's, it has pictures in it. Pictures help. So uh, uh, I learned a lot from this. I'll be honest with you. In 2015, up to 2015, I thought, making maple syrup is rocket science. And after talking with Shad, also we took a trip to Maine, looked at things, and I thought, boiling water is really not rocket science until you get to the end, and then it gets tedious. If you've done this before, you know what it means. Right at the end, that's, that's, that's the part you've got to watch. Um, so I decided, hey, I'm going to venture into this deal. And so my first year was 2016. As a county extension agent, we had taught this at our office. I didn't teach it, but we taught this at our office for probably um, six years or so. And um, it, went, it went great. I'm going to try to step, stay away from, let me try to stay away from these speakers here a little bit. I'm going to try to stay over here. We're getting a little, little bit of feedback. But um, So I ventured into that, and so hopefully... I can give you what I learned, and you all can take it, tweak it to however it works for you all, and go from there. So it truly is a backyard operation. That's my backyard. Uh, you know, if we're going to start somewhere, let's start in the backyard. That's my backyard. It attracted neighbors. The mailman would show up twice a day, once with the mail, once to see what was going on. You're going to attract neighbors. If you've done this, you attract neighbors. Um, People are seeing steam, that sort of thing. They're, they're going to want to know what's going on. So my operation is extremely small scale. So let's start basically. What is maple syrup? Natural occurring sweetener uh, made by concentrating sap of maple, maple trees. Concentrating it. In other words, we're boiling off about 97, 98% of water to get it down to the maple syrup. Uh, it's long been used as a sweetener in North America. Uh, some of the recent studies in Canada have uh, shown its, an, uh, its antioxidant properties or health benefit. Read that. There's some really interesting information there. Shad had sent me some information about six or eight months ago on uh, some new research that had come out on maple syrup, and it's, 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 it's really cool. You're looking at about 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it takes time. It takes time to boil it down. Um, I'll be honest with you, I think mine was 50 to 1 this year. So um, it just depends on what you have. Um, types of maple trees you can use? Sugar maples. These are what you want. You want the sugar maples. They average around 2 to 3%. You may have some sh uh, super sugars that may hit 4 or 5. But uh, you're looking at 2 to 3% sugar. Reds, they're a little bit lower. They may be in that, in that 1 to 2% range. I'll be honest with you, I tried silvers this year. Uh, matter of fact, somewhere around 30% of my sap this year was uh, from silvers. It turned out well. Uh, had a good flavor. I know Ryan had, uh, had done some research on some, uh, on some silvers, and it just uh, had an interesting taste. But I, I combined mine and had a really good flavor. Uh, but that, that, that content, that sugar content is lower. The lower that sugar content, the more you're going to have to boil that water off. In other words, it's 1% sugar, 99% water. So um, you've got to boil that down. So choosing the right maple, look for a healthy one. Try to look at 10 inches uh, in diameter uh, at about 4.5 foot above the ground, breast height. Um, the DBH on that, about 10 inches. You might look at 8 inches or something like that, but 10 inches is the common, the common size. Look for trees that have crowns that are broad and deep. Leaves are the food producers, so you want something that's, you know, got a really good crown. And we're going to talk a little bit about some, uh, some of that on how to control the trees and how to, how to get that, uh, uh, that crown this afternoon. Um, also, make sure these things are easily accessible. 
And you all laugh. <laughs> you all been there and done that. I've got one. I've got, actually got four sugar maple that I don't know what the best way to get into it is. Is either go up the hill to it or come down the hill to it. Uh, because it is, uh, it, it's, it's a booger to get in there. It's, uh, it's really tough to get in there. So if you've got these that are along the side of a road, those are great. Those are, but those are few and far between. Um, supplies. That's going to be the big thing. And I know the folks from Indiana, they brought some items out here. You can check with them to see what they, what they may have. Big thing is taps or spiles. Most people are using a 5 16th. The new one I know is a 3 16th out there. Uh, but most are now 5 16th. So you want to look for the taps or the spiles. Tubing. Do you need tubing or not tubing? Um, and, I'll, and I'll get into that in a little bit as well. Um, cordless drill and drill bit. <clears throat> now you can use a regular drill bit, but the thing is they make these nice tapping drill bits. They're a little pricey, but they're well worth it. Uh, they're a good sharp bit, but uh, you'll need that drill bit, that 5 16 inch drill bit as well. Some collection containers. Food grade buckets. I said food grade buckets. Don't go out here and say, well, I've got this old used motor oil bucket. I believe I'll just clean it up. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. Matter of fact, I saw a picture on the web this week. Uh, it was in a, from what I gather, it was in a, a maple publication that the gentleman was pouring sap into a sap container, and it was a hydraulic oil bucket. And I'm thinking, man, what a beast on the industry, right? Yeah. Uh, so stick with the milk jugs, the uh, transport, uh, tra you're, you're going to have to have transport containers, that sort of thing. On the milk jugs, I will say I prefer water jugs. I tried some of the milk jugs. It don't matter if it was milk, if it was skim milk or 2%, I never could get that milk out of there. Stuck the cap back on it, you know, I'll check it three or four weeks later, and, and it's it still, you know, it, it, then you have the smell of the milk residue in there um, that, that's set for three or four weeks. So I prefer the water jugs, the one gallon water jugs. Rubber mallet or hammer. Uh, transportation and storage container for stap. You got to have that evaporation pan. Some sort of a cooking stove or your evaporator. Uh, fuel. Do you want to use wood, propane, uh, some of the oil fired deal? Uh, but uh, you got to have the fuel. You got to have the filters. You got to have the filters for the sap. You got to have the filters for the uh, for the sugar or, or for the uh, syrup as well. Uh, I noticed our, our friends from Indiana had some filters out there as well. You may want to check with them on that. Um, candy thermometer and or hydrometer. Um, and that depends on the direction you want to go, and I'll get into that in, in a few minutes as well. That finishing pot to finish it off at the end before you can it. Syrup containers. Um, so make sure you clean everything. Clean everything before, after, during the entire process. Cleanliness is going to be the big thing. You got to keep everything clean. Um, when I say, uh, even during the process, I mean, don't let it set a day. Go ahead and clean it. As soon as you finish it, start cleaning it. It's going to be easier to clean it then than it is going to be the next day or two hours before you need to uh, boil sap. But uh, wash all equipment, buckets, evaporation pans. Some may need a milk, uh, chemical milk stone remover uh, to clean boiling pans. Um, you can rinse with a dilute bleach solution. Um, no soap, it can leave a little bit of a residue. You might get a taste from the soap. Uh, and use commercial bleach. Uh, commercial bleach is to totally different than, uh, than your regular household bleaches out here. Uh, also, use about a one part commercial bleach to nine parts water. Uh, and I also mentioned the chemical milk stone to clean some of the boiling pans. Okay, now we're to the drilling and the tapping of the maples. Uh, select those maples. Um, if it's a 10 inch maple at diameter breast height, you're looking at about one tap. Go with one tap. If it's 10 to 15 inches, you can go with a couple of taps. 20 to 25, go with three. Some people say don't go no more than three. Some people say you can probably squeeze in a fourth. But try not to go with no more than three on that. It doesn't matter. More taps are not going to yield, bring you more. Sap. Um, 
So if you're dealing with a 10 to 15 inch tree, look at using two taps. What you want to do is drill, uh, drill a tap, you're going to drill a slide upward angle. I forgot, my dr I forgot my drill, but just a slide upward angle into the tree. You're going to go about an inch and a half to two inches uh, in depth. I'll be honest with you, I go an inch and three quarters. I hit them right in the middle. So I go to inch and three quarters, and it works great. Um, also, don't place anything in there in that hole or blow the shavings out. Uh, just leave it as is. If you'll drill into that tree and drill it, you know, as leave, you know you're just going to drill in and drill back out, uh, it'll clean the hole back out. And the, the, the better the bit, um, the, the better bit you have, the better it'll do about cleaning it out. Place a tap into the hole, tap it in with a hammer or rubber mallet. I said tap. You're not driving number 16 nails, tap it in. Because uh, what you could have is, I know Shad saw this at one point in time, you could break the, you could break the spile, you could drive it in there so deep that the actual sap cannot flow out the tap. And so what you're doing is tap, tap, and a lot of times if you're just tap, tap, that hammer or that mallet will bounce back off, and the sound will change. It'll definitely change. If you've done this for a while, you'll notice that that tap will change, that sound of that tap, you know, tap, tap, usually tap, tap, and then that hammer will kind of bounce, bounce a little bit. So tap gently until you hear that solid, solid connection. Uh, don't drive it all the way in. Damage, uh, it could break the tap, damage the tree as well. Um, like I mentioned, don't over tap, and it doesn't necessarily give you more sap. Also, under tapping reduces the yield of sap. It won't necessarily help the tree. For instance, if you've got one that's 15 inches in diameter and you walk out there and just put one tap in it, you could be losing out a little bit on this. So, there's what I used. It works. It was simple. I'll pass this around. It is a milk jug, piece of actual, actually maple tubing, and then it's got the spile, and all I did was take a piece of wire and wire it to the spile. And it worked great for me. Uh, I'll pass that around. It's always good to have a little bit of help. That's my, my niece there. Also, I used a sap, one of the old-fashioned sap buckets uh, on a couple of trees. It got debris in it. I really didn't like it because it got debris in it. And the wind would blow, and it's constantly doing this number here. But I did use a couple of those. Um, but I preferred the milk jug, that type deal. There's looking at one of, the, uh, one of the areas that I tapped. There's about four sugar maples, large sugar maples there. And um, those, those done very well, very well. The good thing is, is when you're going in and collecting sap, if you have, if you're using the milk jug process, if I knew that I had, going into an area and I had six milk jugs, I would take in maybe four milk jugs with me that were empty. And all I did was trade the milk jugs out. And that, that helped. So measuring the sap for sweetness, uh, sap and syrup, uh, syrup for sweetness. Bricks is that measurement of sugar. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for that bricks. And a hydrometer or the refractometer measures the sugar content by floating it in a sample of sap or syrup. That's what you're using for the hydrometer. And I noticed there's some hydrometers out there for sale and some hydrometer cups. So that may be something you want to look at getting. Tap hydrometer and the syrup hydrometer, uh, they're, 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 they're great. That's something you want. Bricks is measured in a degree. And what we're looking at is, for instance, um, the higher the bricks, the less, less boiling time. Uh, it will take sugar maple, like I mentioned, with three bricks is better than a silver maple with one brick. We discussed that earlier. So there's your hydrometer and cup. And it's showing there that it's... Uh, that it's tested out, that it's ready to go. It's somewhere around 67 bricks is what you want. And these publications will, will guide you through that. I'm just kind of hitting the highlights there. Also, the sap flow does depend on weather. Yeah, it does. Weather had a lot to do with it, I think. Uh, one of the things Shad and I talked about was that I feel that it had to do with the warm December we had. And we really had, a, if you remember, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day was very warm last year. 
And I think that had to do with it just, it had to do with a warm December and the trees never got a chance to get started. Plus, we had some warm periods throughout the winter. So yeah, it depends on it. Begin tapping when future temperatures begin reaching that 40 degrees during the day. Uh, sap flow happens at night when temps get down to 20 de around 20 degrees. It doesn't have to be 20 degrees, but down around 20 degrees. And then 40 during the day. So temps must fall and rise above that 32 degree mark. Uh, it's got to pretty much freeze, and then it's got to thaw out. Uh, so that's what you want. And it has to do with a, a pressure Early January is probably the best time to begin. Begin watching that weather in late December. For instance, I started tapping January the 9th last year. I know that I talked to somebody else earlier, and they started, I think some of the Gillums, they, taught, they tapped early uh, that first week in January. I know you all tapped around that first week in January, but you're looking at tapping a little earlier than that, maybe even as in the next couple weeks before Christmas. So start watching that weather. That way you don't lose that like you all did there in Wise County, and that's and it, it was it was all over like that. So watch that. Um, also, holes that have no sap flow for around seven days, they are in danger of drying up. I'm not saying they're going to dry up, but they could dry up, and so that's what you got to be careful about too. And so it, you got to watch that weather forecast and uh, and go from there. A little bit of sap management. Sugar maple that has about 3% sugar, you're looking at about 90% water. Uh, when collecting sap, keep it cool. It's just like milk. It's going to spoil. And it will spoil, and it will get rancid, and it will smell. It'll have that rancid smell, and uh, like milk does. So try to keep it, uh, keep it cool. Keep those temperatures above or uh, around 40, uh, or actually below uh, 40. If they get above 40, you may have to uh, refrigerate it. So... Keep that sap above, below 40 degrees. If it freezes, that's fine. It'll fall back out. If you've got it in a bucket, you can dump it right in the, uh, uh, in the evaporator, in an evaporator pan, it'll be fine. Uh, sap gets cloudy or smells, throw it away. Don't use it. Also, sap flow, one tree could produce as much as 15, 5 to 15 gallons per, of sap per season. The low flow may produce only a few ounces, and I think that's what we saw at some points uh, this year in, in January and February. We saw that, uh, that low flow. The, the evaporator. This is my deal. This is what I use to cook on. This is my stove. Uh, it's simple. All I did was stack up some block. I used propane. used a propane burner. Uh, I thought it would cost me a fortune, and it really wasn't as expensive as I thought it was. And it's the reason the way I designed my... Uh, I'm going to design the stove. You'll notice I've used uh, concrete blocks, and I used a piece of expanded metal sitting on the top. And then I used my pan. The pan I used, food service pan. You beginners, these are great. You can find these things for 30 bucks or less. This one here is a six inch pan. They make them in four and six inches, and this is what's called a full size, and I think it's 11 by 21, thereabouts. And uh, those things work great, and uh, they'll heat up fairly quick. And so when I started this thing, I laid it on top of the expanded metal, the burners underneath it, everything's going great. But I'm losing heat. I'm losing heat before I even started. So if you'll notice the, the two layers of brick up there, they're now surrounding the pan, and I'll show, I'll show that picture in just a second. But this worked for me. And so once I got it started, I would block off the, the front here that you're looking at the burner there. Use a heat source that's going to work best for you. Propane works good for you, use propane. If you've got wood, use wood. Uh, wood's definitely going to be cheaper. Um, but both are great sources. Also, building a firebox that retains the heat and allows the heat to properly rise to the evaporator pan. You don't want it going out the sides. You don't want it going out somewhere else. You want it going straight up underneath that pan. That's where you want it. Boiling the sap, make sure you have plenty of time on hand for boiling and making syrup. If you've got two hours, you're not going to get this done. You're going to have to go in and you're going to have to schedule a day off. Saturdays was my bowl day. It was my bowl day. And I knew that on Saturday, that's when I was going to have to do everything. I had to block the day off, everything that was, uh, 
had to be done any other day but Saturday. I collected sap during the week, or I had my dad collecting sap during the week, keep it cool, and then on Saturdays we boil. Matter of fact, on a Sunday, right at the end of the season, on a Sunday, I just thought, you know, this temperature fluctuation is about perfect. And I went and found enough sap to do a boil. And, and I actually went out on a Sunday and done a boil. But um, um, make some time for the boil. This is when the neighbors show up. This is when my mailman kept showing up twice a day. Uh, they're going to show up, they're going to look at things, and they're going to ask questions, and uh, a great conversation piece, definitely. You know, you may be getting up to 10 hours to properly boil down 10 gallons of sap. Hopefully it won't be like this on this pan, but a lot that time, a lot that time. Uh, also, the rule of thumb is, like I mentioned, 40 gallons of sap make one gallon of syrup, and this is going to vary with tree species. Sugar's going to be quicker. Uh, it's going to be closer to that 40 gallons to one. Silver, maybe not so much. It may run somewhere around 65 to one, 70 to one. Strain or filter that sap prior to placing it in a boiling evaporator. This is going to remove any of the debris. That's the cool thing about the, uh, about the milk jug that's going around. You don't have that debris. If you'll notice the way that's in there, it's locked in. There's no debris getting in, into that, uh, uh, into that, uh, that jug. So boiling the sap, do this outdoors. You know what I mean. Do this outdoors. Unless you've got a sugar house that is specifically for this, with a vent hood and that sort of thing, you can do it outdoors. You can do it indoors. But boil outdoors. Don't go, start, don't go to the kitchen, to the stove, and say, I'm going to boil this stuff off. You're going to make a mess. You're going to make a mess. And gentlemen, your wives are going to kill you if you even attempt to do this. Uh, so boil outdoors. Um, use a wide flat pan if possible. This will increase the surface area. That's why I went with this. Um, I've known of people using the, the turkey fryers. Those work okay, but they don't hold the heat. There's not enough surface area there, and they just don't hold the heat. These things here will hold the heat better. Like I said, I had the bricks stacked up around them. You're going to get a quicker ball. Yeah, the turkey fryer containers, the big, the big pots, they're going to be okay. You're going to get a ball off of those but it's not going to be as good a bowl as you would out of a flat pan like this. <clears throat> also, don't let the sap level drop below about an inch. You could scorch the pan, and you could also scorch that sap, burn that sap. So try to keep it in that pan above one inch. Also, when boiling, white foam may form on the surface. Just skim that off. Uh, once your sap is getting close to the surface, you may want to finish in a smaller pot so that you can control the boil better. What I did is I would go from that pan and I'd switch over to one of these, and they work great. Uh, I may even go down to, if it was a small boil, I may even have to go down to something like two quarts or something like that if it's a small boil. But usually I could switch over to this and finish things off. So there's a top view of my deal early on, the crack in the center between the two cinder blocks at the bottom, I ended up filling that in with, uh, with brick, and that worked great. The pan on the left was, under, uh, was over the direct heat. The pan on the right was actually over indirect heat, and that was my warming pan. That allowed me to uh, have the warm sap. I wasn't taking cold sap that was 40 degrees or less and putting it on the bowl and, and knocking my bowl down. What I was doing is that, that was staying somewhere 115, 120 degrees, and I would dip out of that as the, as the level dropped in the, uh, in the boiling pan, I would dip out of that into the, uh, into the pan that was boiling. Or actually, I'd dip out of the warming pan. So I kept my tank out of the way and uh, just used a uh, matter of fact, there's an old road sign that I used. That's just to keep the, the heat in. You want to keep that heat in, uh, that area. Also to keep that wind knocked off. A little bit of a breeze, and it's constantly knocking that fire down. You know how it is with a grill, uh, propane, it'll, that breeze is going to knock that bowl down. So to keep that, uh, the breeze off of it, uh, that works. I remember one day, it got so bad windy, uh, we actually put up a tarp to kind of keep that wind knocked down. So. so finishing the syrup, sap becomes syrup when it reaches 67% sugar, 33% water. Also that brick, 67 bricks. 
An inexpensive way to measure it uh, is when the uh, syrup reaches seven degrees above the boiling point of water. The boiling point of water um, at my house is 209. And I think I talked to Seth at some point in time that was about his boiling point of water. So seven, seven and a half degrees above that, I knew that at 216 I could pull it off. And it was really, really, really close to that 67%. Uh, it's amazing how close it is to that. Um, more accurate way, like I mentioned, would be to invest in that syrup hydrometer uh, and a cup. Those things work great. Um, also, do not uh, stir the sap at its cooking. Just let it, let it do its thing. Cheryl? Yes? Uh, yes. That changes. It will. It changes the pressure. Uh, there's a really cool app that I actually downloaded onto my phone, and it allowed me to put in um, the information, the actual boiling, uh, actual the pressure, the elevation for the day, and to get that that information. But it stayed; those Saturdays for some reason stayed right around 216. But it will definitely change. The idea is just simply just go boil water, and see what that as as soon as it starts a rolling boil, just check the temperature, add seven to it, and that's what you want. Exactly. That's that's a simple way to do it. Good good information. Thank you. Okay, I know in sorghum you stir it from time to time. You don't stir this stuff. Just let it let it do its thing. Uh, so here here it is right near the finishing. And so all I've got is a simple candy thermometer in there. And so I know where two sixteen is and once it gets to that point, that allows me to pull it off. Um, and then if I have to go down to a two say a two quart pot, um, depending on how much sap or how little sap I have, I can go down to that as well to finish. So filtering and camming the syrup, uh, that's going to be the last steps. Syrup needs to be about between 180, 185, you could bump up to maybe 190 to can this stuff. That's where you want it to, uh, to can it at. Are you going to pour, the, pour, this, uh, pour it through? I used, I used both. I used the coffee filter. That's cheap. They have the Orlon filters out front. Uh, I use both of those. Uh, the Orlon filters, you can use them several times, just wash them out, but both of those work great. Um, this filtering process is going to collect most uh, sugar sand, or what's called nitre. And I'm going to pass this around, if I can dig it out of here. Shad's going to talk a little bit about filtering later, I think you're, are you talking, some, somebody's talking about filtering. Okay. In the bottom there, try not to shake that if you don't care. But in the bottom there, you can see the, see the nitre. It's resting on the bottom. Just, just kind of pass it through. That stuff's not going to hurt you. Uh, I, think, I think it was uh, Ben McKinney that told us, uh, what were they saying? They were using it as a hand scrub, maybe. I think it's what he told us, using it as a hand scrub somewhere, using the nitre. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, that's going to be there. Uh, it's, but it's directly in the bottom. You don't have to worry about that. Some of my bowls have more nitre in it, and I know that you folks that have been doing this for a while, some bowls will have more nitre than other bowls. Uh, so that's, that tends to be part of the process. Now, if you're tired of nitre and don't want this nitre, they have a very nice filter press out there as well, and that'll, that'll take care of the nitre a whole lot easier. Um, some sugar stand may still be present after the filtering, uh, but it really is, like I mentioned, not really an issue, but it's going to be there, so don't get too disturbed over it. Uh, after filling the container and tightening the lid, lay the container on its side for a few minutes, or I'd lay it on its side or turn it upside down. That would allow the hot syrup to come in contact with the container, thus sterilizing the container. Now, that doesn't mean you can't wash the container. You shouldn't wash the container before you start, uh, but uh, try to wash that out uh, before you start. Uh, what I did is I would wash that, Sterilize it just like I would if I was going to if I was going to uh, can some jelly in there or can beans or whatever. That's how I treated that prior to filling it. There's a finished product. Good for ice cream. Good for about anything. So finishing the season, this is where our wrap up is. Sap flow uh, in eastern Kentucky or in this area, uh, you're looking about the first to mid part of March. Mine shut down the first weekend in March. It was over with. Uh, it was coming to an end. I went fishing in Alabama the first weekend in March, come home, and it was, it was quit, gone. Uh, so the first weekend in March. So it may vary. 
It may vary as far as middle of March, say St. Patrick's Day. Uh, so it just depends on that weather. Uh, at the end of the season, the sap's going to start turning yellow. It's going to start turning cloudy. Uh, you're going to see it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a buddy smell to it. Uh, it'll even have a buddy taste to the sap. Uh, at that point in time, start getting ready to pull taps. Um, good rule of thumb, stop collecting when the buds of the maple start to break open. And when they start to break open, you know, you may have buds that sits on there for a while. Uh, there's some buds on some maples right now, you know. But until they start to break open, uh, you're, you should be in good shape. When finished, clean everything. Pack it away for the next sap gathering uh, season. Uh, clean whatever. My evaporator right now is in the basement of my house. I tore everything down. I packed it up and put everything under the house. That way I can pull it all out. And within the next week or so, I'll start setting things back up, getting ready. Um, um, I had uh, brought a few items as well. For you beginners, if you've not invested in a toolbox, you're going to need one. I found out real quick I was going to have to have something to haul all my junk around. So I suggest a toolbox, anything like that. Um, when, you're, when you're canning, these things are nice. These are great. These look great. They hide a lot of niter in there, too. Uh, <laughs> one of the things we wanted to do, too, as well, is share the information. We want to share it with each other. Uh, like uh, Keith had mentioned, this is the only thing in the area. We're having to go to places. He's having to go to places like Vermont for information, share information. We're going to Maine for information. And so now that we've hooked up with each other, hopefully we can share with each other. And that's what we want to have to happen. So happy, happy sugaring.